Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Book of New Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. Hope you all had a wonderful weekend. Hope your week is off to a good start. All of those those fun hopes. I mean, yeah, I really do hope all of those things. And you know, as always, I hope you had plenty of time to read, because that's my hope for you every day, that you find yourself plenty of time to read. Even more time than I have to read. I, I've feel like I don't read enough anymore and I wish I read more so you read for me okay please <laughs> and, and, and then send me all your collective knowledge that would be awesome at the end of the last episode I mentioned that I would be interviewing uh, Paul Russell Semendinger on this inter- this episode of the podcast as I mentioned the book is called Scattering the Ashes and I said that it, it feels like a memoir it's not it's it's a novel But it is the story of a man who is scattering his father's ashes, but in places that his father requests. So it's also one of those stories of giving being given a task when someone that you love has died and trying to carry that out to, you know, their carry out their wishes, etc. Let me read you the back of the book. Um, Sam Holmes is a young, enthusiastic teacher who is training for the historic New York City Marathon, his first. But Sam's life is radically changed when his father suddenly passes away. His father's final wishes are unique. To earn his inheritance, Sam's father is sending him on a quest to travel to the places that had been special to his father and scatter his ashes at these destinations. Instead of a pleasant summer, Sam is thrust into a journey he didn't want. But as Sam first visits Cooperstown, then Washington, D.C., he begins to truly understand his father and himself. While in Washington, Sam meets Rachel, a young woman who brings direction and companionship to Sam's life. As he faces a a contract dispute at work, a budding romance, and running in his first marathon, Sam Holmes must make the critical decisions that will impact the rest of his life. And so there you have the description of Scattering the Ashes. You can tell how it could feel a bit like a memoir, but again, it's not a memoir. I'm just, I just have memoirs on the brain because the last two interviews were about memoirs, so I have them on the brain. But it's, it's also one of those kind of, there, there's, a, there's a word for it, but one of those journeys when you're doing something again for a family member who has died or a loved one who has died that maybe you didn't want to do but there's specific instructions and so you're trying to carry those out it feels kind of like a, a zany road trip <laughs> almost you know, except that it's with your father's ashes instead of your father that's a I don't know if that's dark humor or not but I've read other books that have similar concepts that have people on road trips scattering the ashes of loved ones and this falls into that that category but here we have Sam and Sam is the youngest of the three children he is still living in the house that his parents that he grew up in he lived there he he bought it from his parents when his father moved in after his mother died and his father moved into a retirement home or assisted living place and so he's still living in the house he grew up in he's at something of a crossroads you know he wants he wants marriage and family and he he's trying to find a little bit of direction in his life he's training for the marathon his siblings are um, away they've moved out west they're a lot older than he was anyway so he was kind of an only child and so now he has this this quest if you will this these instructions that his father has left him and they are it's not just like you have the instructions in front of you so you know step by step where you're you're going to go no once he completes a step then his father's lawyer gives him an envelope with the next part of the journey on there and you can imagine that he's he's a little resentful that his time has been taken over I probably would feel the same way but he really does 
embark on this journey of self-discovery as well as getting to know his father in a different way and he and his father were close but he really begins to get to know his father in a different way and of course then he meets Rachel and there's that aspect of new relationships and figuring out how that all works in his life and she helps him to uh, figure out some of the things that he's been struggling with so it's um it's definitely a book that takes you on a journey, both emotional and uh, physical road trip kind of journey. Let's go ahead and turn to the interview then with Paul so he can talk about his own book instead of me rambling on about it. Again, the book is called Scattering the Ashes, and the author is Paul Russell Semendinger. Hi, Paul. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. I am happy to have you here. Uh, we're going to talk about your new book, Scattering the Ashes. Before we get to the book, though, if you could start by sharing a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, and once again, thank you so much for having me. My name is Paul Semendinger, and I'm a public school uh, principal in New Jersey. I've been in public education for 30 years. I was a I was a middle school history teacher, and then I've risen through the ranks of administration, be, basically being an administrator at every level, high school vice principal, a middle school principal, and now I'm at the most wonderful elementary school in the world, and I've been here for about 13 years now um, as the principal in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Uh, in addition to that, I'm, a, I'm happily married. I have three grown children. And they are all the loves of my, li of my life. I spent my uh, years when they were growing up coaching their teams and, and trying to be the best dad I could be. And besides that, I, I still play baseball. I play softball and I like to run marathons. And that's pretty much me. All right. Well, there's, that's, that's a lot. I mean, that's impressive. I, I love that you are now an elementary school principal. That's got to be you know, challenging at times, but I'm sure you have a lot of fun stories about the antics of small children. Absolutely, and, and they're great. So I'm very lucky. I, I work in a positive school. I have great teachers who, who all are, have a passion for kids and just being great teachers, and the parents are very supportive. The kids are great. So, yeah, I'm re really lucky to be where I am. That's wonderful. Yeah, I love that. So we are here to talk about your book. Um, again, it's called Scattering the Ashes. Can you give an overview of that story? Sure, I would love to. I, and uh, I'm so glad we have a chance to talk about it. Scattering the Ashes is a novel. Some people think it's a memoir. They say it's written as, as, as if it were a memoir. And they say, like, I can't believe it's true. But like any author, you write stuff that it could be based on truth. And I think, you know, if you, if you write a lot of your own self sometimes comes through, but it's certainly not a memoir. It's a story about a young man who was a teacher. And the summer is beckoning. And he's excited about that because he figures he's going to have a nice, long, wonderful summer. And he is going to actually train for his first marathon. And he lives alone. He's, he's in his mid to late 20s. He lives alone. He's lonely. He doesn't really admit that. And each day he would go visit his father who lived in an assisted uh, living facility, probably a few miles away from his house. Um, I think about two or three miles away from his house. And um, He's looking forward to this great endless summer and, and, and just spending time doing what he wants to do and, you know, making time to visit also with his dad. And so the story begins with his relationship with his dad and then his father unfortunately passes away. And then his father leaves a strange stipulation in his will that says he can't receive his inheritance until he fulfills a number of these wishes his dad has, which, is, which are to scatter his ashes at various specific places that he and his father, for the most part, had traveled to when he was growing up with his dad. Um, and so the story is really about this adventure or these series of adventures that he has to take in order to fulfill his father's wishes. Each time after he scatters the ashes in a certain, sp in a certain place, he has to go back and visit the attorney who then hands him a letter that his father had written before he had passed away. And the stories and the letters, they all seem to intertwine with what's happening in his life as he is going through these series of tasks, an adventure he neither asked for nor really wanted. He actually has a chance to find himself. And along the way, he does find a girl who, who he falls in love with. Her name is Rachel Parker. She really becomes the star of the whole book. 
and the story becomes the, the tale of him and Rachel and his father who had passed. And, and it's, I think it's a heartwarming story. Uh, as I say, people say, think it's a memoir, but the first person to read the manuscript was my dad, who is still alive. And I said, Dad, how would you like to read a book about a guy whose father dies? <laughs> See, tell me if you like it. And uh, my, my, my dad loved it. And so does my mom. Uh, and uh, that's the story. And, you know, it's, I think it's humorous. There's good uh, fun in there. There's, I think it's somewhat funny. Um, while also being poignant and reflective and spiritual and a story of a, of a, of a young man and, a, and the life he had with his father. Yeah, in some ways it's a, a father-son road trip story, except that, you know, the father is only present in letters and, and in his ashes. Uh, I, I did appreciate in his first letter, he said, you know, don't worry about the expenses. I've covered that, but don't order anything over $5 off the menu. Yes. <laughs> That's a bad yes. thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually something my grandfather would have said. I remember that that was sort of like a borrowed idea. Like when we would do something, he'd be like, you, you can get whatever you want as long as it's under whatever amount of money. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So good luck in this day and age getting $5. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just put you on a diet, dude. <laughs> <laughs> While you ponder what you're going to order from the dollar menu when you go out with your dad next time, uh, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, Paul will be talking about his initial inspiration for this story. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. I am speaking today with Paul Russell Semendinger about his uh, book, Scattering the Ashes. Before the break, I was way too amused by myself and the, uh, with myself and the idea of the $5, you know, ordering anything under $5 off the menu. I can just hear my father or either of my grandfathers making that offer and possibly my grandmother as well. At any rate, let's go ahead and return now to the interview with Paul so what was your initial inspiration for the story? That's a great question. The, that part of it is actually uh, autobiographical. So I loved to travel with my wife and my kids. And the story was actually written a long time ago. Just, just the very basic framework in my head when I thought about myself. I would always map out these great little uh, uh, trips. You know, we would do you know, the Disney World trip and the big things like that, that that I felt we had to do and which we loved. But I also love to just take road trips. And like we live in New Jersey, so take let's take 10 days and we'll drive through New England. And I would sit there and I would pour over maps and try to find interesting places for us to spend the night and to visit and to explore. And whenever we got somewhere, I would always say like, boy, oh boy, I can't wait to get to the next spot. But whenever we leave, I kept would always say, I can't wait till we come back here. And somehow that just, you know, formulated in my brain. Like, I always want to keep coming back to the places where we had been, but I always want to go to the next place. And then, you know, at some point you realize there's a lot of these places we'll never come back to. And even if we do, my little boys will all be grown up and, and things are different. So that's really where the idea came from. Maybe, maybe someday I should make my kids scatter my ashes at these places which I wouldn't do to them. <laughs> it's, it's some burden, right? <laughs> did, did they read the book and, and ask you if you were going to make them do that? <laughs> they, they have read the book and then asked. They said, Dad, you're not going to really do that, are you? I said, I don't know, but Grandpa might make me do it now that he's read the book. So <laughs> I love it. So have you been to Philadelphia? <laughs> each of yes yes each of the places in there i've been to yes and so okay. uh, that just made me laugh as i'd never been to philadelphia but, you know, 
yeah. not laughed so much as just kind of you know smiled that there's a that there's all those you know I grew up I grew up in the west and so things are everything's so far apart and and my first time to the east coast I was like wow everything is not so far apart correct everything's very close but you know what's interesting when you live your whole life here we're just north of New York City, we're probably, if there's no traffic, less than a half an hour from zooming right down the highways and getting into Manhattan. But Philadelphia, which is probably two and a half hours to three hours away, if there's traffic or whatever, always seemed pretty far. <laughs> you know, because New York was so close. So right, no, and you know, traffic and all of all of that. It's it, it's different to drive two and a half hours in traffic than it is to drive four hours on it really barely populated road <laughs> yes yes so it's all a matter of perspective i guess it is it is so so he, he sam goes on this on this adventure um and and this trip which really is a lot it helps him to find out a lot about himself what about sam as the main character do you think will resonate with readers I think the fact that he's human and that he's flawed and, and that he's going through something that he didn't necessarily want to go through. And the fact that, you know, he starts to embrace the whole idea because he realizes that the father didn't do this to burden him. The father did this as a, as a way to express his love for his son. And so, and, and again, his relationship with Rachel, I just think is, is precious. I, I, I like their interactions he does numbers of goofy things, as you know, um, that, that I think will make the reader chuckle. And and he grows, and he beca- he's a great teacher, and he, he becomes a better person as a result of of what happens in his in his life throughout the book. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a couple of things that he and his father share an interest in. One is baseball, and one is running. Uh, and actually, running seems to be pardon my pun, a running metaphor throughout the book. Um, <laughs> yes. Can you talk about, can you talk about the aspect of running throughout the book and, and the role that it plays? Sure. So, so Sam is a runner and he's about to embark on his training to run his first marathon, which is going to be the New York city marathon. And um, so what I tried to do throughout the book in regard to that is, is, really give the reader a sense of what it's like to be a runner and train for a marathon and then run the marathon. So one of the longest chapters is actually when he runs the New York City Marathon and you get a sense of what he goes through as he goes through this whole process. Uh, I, I, I like to consider myself an athlete. I didn't run a whole lot when I was growing up, but in my late 30s, I did get in the New York City Marathon and I ran it and it was transformative. And as I say, I still run marathons now in my early 50s. And um, people have told me that my description of, of what it's like to run a marathon in the, in the novel is, is uh, some people have said it's the best example of what it's like to run a marathon that they've ever read. So that's, that's nice. I, and I think, I think we learn a lot about ourselves when we push ourselves into areas that are outside of our comfort zone. And, and for Sam, for me, um, running marathons, was way outside of his comfort zone. And I think he did learn a lot about himself. And the other character, as I mentioned, Rachel Parker, she was also a marathon runner, but she had already run a a marathon. And so she became his support and his guide. And as they start to build the relationship and start to fall in love, one of the things that they start to do together is run. And it's a way that they build a nice connection and a bond. Yeah, it's definitely a, a theme throughout the story. What um, when you were when you were thinking about the the steps in this journey that Sam would take, did you think about some of the places that that you had been with your children, or how did you decide where to send Sam through these letters? Great question. No one has ever asked me that. I think it was just a matter of. Uh, uh, the first place to go is Cooperstown. That was easy because I've been with my children. My dad took me there. We we spent all together, all of us, a lot of time in Cooperstown, New York at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And 
what is autobiographical is my dad is a real Red Sox fan, and my dad absolutely adores Ted Williams. And if my dad were ever to write something like this, the place he would definitely send me would be to Cooperstown. <laughs> this is something with Ted Williams. That's that's not even a question. So that one became easy. The other places just sort of grew out of places that have been meaningful in my life uh, and places that I've, I'd like to go, and, and, and I felt it was – it was easier for me to write about places that I enjoy being at because that allows me allowed me to really spend time. As you know, in your writing, you have to really invest in, in all these, every page and every word. And, and if I was writing about places that I didn't enjoy being at, that would have made the task, you know, burdensome. And one of the things that, uh, that I find when I write and I really get into writing is sometimes the stories just seem to write themselves. Like you just get into it and you find yourself thinking like the characters and, and being in those situations that you're writing about and the words just tend to flow. And I guess as I was writing and I was just thinking about where he might be going next, the, these various places popped into my head and we, and I started writing about them. And did you rely mainly on your own experience from being in those places, or did you do any specific research for the book? Um, I'm always doing research for everything. I, I, I read all the time and all that. But did I do research specifically about those places? Not necessarily, because I've been to them and I've experienced them through my own life. And you mentioned that you um, are uh, a principal. You've been in education for 30 years. Can you talk about, uh, is there a relationship between your life in education and your career as a writer? Do they, do they influence one another? Actually, they do. The first book that I had published, I, I wrote, a, I wrote I've written a couple of children's books that, that were published uh, about, a, about a principal, in fact, named Principal Sam, who... Um, makes mistakes all the time. And the funny thing is the kids are able to correct the mistakes that Principal Sam makes. Um, I, I thought this was going to be like the greatest thing. <laughs> it was going to be the biggest hit. It never, it never really took off. And, and I ended up after having a small publisher released the first couple, uh, that small publisher basically got out of the publishing business, gave me the rights back. And they're just, um, what do you call self-published at this point. But the first grown-up book that I had published is a series of essays called Impossible is an Illusion. And they're all motivational. A lot of them focus on education because that whole book of essays came out of something that, that I do that most people don't necessarily do like, like I do on this is every single Friday I publish a little newsletter. It's a memo that I give to my teachers. Now, a lot of principals do that, but most of them don't write some introspective, reflective, motivational piece to begin it that could be up to three or four or five pages long. Um, to just like, I basically pour out my thoughts and my ideas and whatever in this in these passages. And uh, teachers over the years have read them and been inspired by them. And over the years, people said, "You want to publish these? You want to put them together, make a book?" I'm like, ah, I don't know. And I started putting some of them online and getting some got positive feedback. Of, uh, putting them on ed, uh, educational sites and getting some positive feedback. And I finally said, maybe I should gather them together. All these little motivational ones, the best ones I've written, because if you figure I've been a principal for over 20 ooh, some odd years now, 23 years, 24 years. Um, you can imagine that I have a whole, whole lot of these essays that, that I wrote. So I took the best one, the, my, some of my favorites and, and called them together into the book Impossible is an Illusion. So, yeah, the two things definitely go hand in hand, no doubt. And there is an educational theme in Scattering the Ashes that's um, something else that inf influences Sam as he's going through his life and, and, and that whole year. There's a, um, a very difficult contract negotiation between the Board of Ed and the teachers. And I think people don't get a chance to see what, what that sometimes looks like either. As, as somebody who's maybe not be in the industry. And so you get to see some of the struggles that Sam has is, you know, there's all sorts of, um, you know, debating between, you know, negotiations on what the teachers can get, what the board is offering and how the teachers respond and, and things like that. 
Yeah, that was interesting for me to read as an adult because uh, my dad was a teacher, um, and so growing up, it, you know, there were there were negotiations and and things like that. And as a kid, I had absolutely no idea what was going on. I just knew that there was Correct. something going on, and the parents were talking about it. So that that was interesting to to read about as an adult. It's time for our second break of the podcast, but I will admit that even when I got older, even when I was in junior high or high school, I'm sure there had to have been negotiations that went on in terms of contracts, etc. But either I was just completely oblivious or my parents didn't talk about it in front of us or a combination thereof. Although it was a small town, everybody kind of knew everything about everything thing and everyone so I really don't know probably me being completely oblivious would be the answer to that question at any rate let's go ahead and take that break when we come back we'll be talking about of course writing and other fun topics with Paul Russell Semendinger so stay tuned you're listening to the GSMC book review podcast and I'll be right back Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am your frequently oblivious host, Sarah. I am speaking with the not oblivious author, Paul Russell Semendinger. We are speaking about his book, Scattering the Ashes. So let's go ahead and return now to that interview. What made you decide after writing a couple of children's books and then writing, um, you know, collating your essays, why did you decide to write a, a novel? To be honest, I think the novel, well, well, the essays, like I say, I've been writing like that for, you know, 20 some odd years because it was just part of a way that I connected with my teaching staff um, as, as, as the principal. But as far as the novel, the novel really was something I wrote before the children's books. And I have a whole bunch of children's books ideas. You, you know, when you're working full time and you're you're writing on the side and things like that, you don't have all the time in the world to necessarily follow all of your ideas and all of your dreams and all that kind of stuff. So I have some children's books. Maybe someday when I retire, I'll be able to invest more time in polishing them and working with publishers to get those published as well. But well, to answer the question specifically, the novel I was writing for years and years and years, and it just, uh, you know, it takes a long time to get a novel to be where you want it to be and to get a publisher to be interested in publishing it and to get it out and, and, and all that. But it wasn't like I was I transitioned from one type of writing to the other. It's these these are all happening all at the same time. Okay. And are you working on anything new now? Yes, I have a follow up book of essays that should be coming out. The uh publisher um said that it's gonna come out soon. Uh it's called Possibility is Everything and uh that should be coming out from Tree District Books, probably late february or early march if all goes well they're 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 still just working with me on on some final edits and things like that i was thinking that the publication date was going to be farther away and then they reached out like two weeks ago and said we might be able to get this out sooner so that's great i oh, also uh yeah yeah i'm also a big baseball fan i'm a, i run a yankees blog called start spreading the news and it's very, very popular, and it's it's primarily about the Yankees, but there's a lot of regular baseball stuff on there. And 
I have a book about the Yankees that has a target. Well, it's it's a it's actually a firm date of October first, twenty twenty one, of this year. It's a book coming out. It's it's a history of the Yankees, but a history of the Yankees told in a tr- totally unique way. The book is called The Least Among Them. And in Yankees history, there were 29 players whose entire career lasted of but one game. But that one game came as a member of the Yankees. And this is the book of the story of those guys and how what happened in their lives and in their careers. But nobody's ever heard of most of them or any of them. And so what I then do is I take something that happened in their unique situation and relate that to a bigger story about Yankees history or tell things about Yankees history than ways that people have never told it before. And this book already is uh, making a lot of sales in, uh, you know, the pre-print run or whatever they call it, you know, like before you can get a book. And I have sent it to a host of, you know, big time baseball writers and the feedback that I'm getting back is just tremendously positive. So I'm very excited about that book. It's coming out. It's called the, the least among them on October 1st. That, yeah, that sounds like a, a really different um, approach than just your your normal kind of um, sports book. So that's very cool. When did you start writing? Obviously, you've written the, the essays to your teachers for years, but is writing for publication something that you always wanted to do? Yes. Uh, when I was in college... This this is actually kind of funny. This is this is the things you do in college. Though, so we're going to college in the mid 1980s, so it's just at the dawn of of being able to like computer word process things and stuff like that. I I, I typed all my papers on a typewriter, electric typewriter, but you know I was I was ahead of the computer thing. That's how, how long ago this was. But my roommate and I were big Beatles fans, and we decided that we would try to write a book. I remember there was no internet back then. Just trying to cull whatever knowledge we could by finding things in libraries and bookstores and, and record stores. But we were going to write a book that talked about every single song the Beatles ever wrote. And we started writing this thing and we figured this was going to be a hit and everybody was going to go crazy. Somebody finally wrote a book about all the Beatles songs. And then we found out that that had been done like three or four times, but it took a lot. Long- <laughs> Again, there was no internet to check against. <laughs> it was just what we could get our hands on. So that was the first thing that we came close to actually thinking we were going to publish. Um, I, I wrote a book. I might revisit this one event again someday too. I wrote a book with a colleague once a long time ago about how to be a better teacher that was based on workshops that I do and that I deliver for teachers. Um, and I don't know if you remember Robert Fulgham. He wrote like uh, All You Ever Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. He was a minister and he wrote little mm-hmm. inspirational passages, which, it, which isn't unlike um, Impossible is an Illusion. Um, but I remember when I was a senior in college, I started writing my own little essays. They were just about experiences that I had. And I really had thoughts that maybe someday all of that would come together as a book, but it never did. And, and I never, you know, it was when you start writing or when you do anything, you, you, you go through periods and you find out like some of the stuff that you're doing is, isn't great and it's not very good. And, and you need to continue to practice your skill and hone your skills. So, you know, I wrote those little essays even back then, but they weren't publishable. Though I did get published in my, uh, in my literary magazine at, in, uh, at college uh, and, and in high school too, as I come to think of it, a couple of short um, fictional pieces that got published a long time ago. So I guess I've always been writing. Just I hadn't really thought about being published till, uh, till many years later. Right. Well, and, you know, each of those experiences, whether you were published in your high school or college, uh, literary magazine or, or, or not were probably a good experience and taught you a lot. Absolutely. And that's how, that's how we get good at anything, right? You just have to keep practicing and, and working at it and trying to find ways to hone your craft and find your own writer's voice and, and, you know, all the, all of those things. Yeah. Um, I, I want to backtrack just a little bit because when I first started reading the book, I, I don't remember what page it was on, it's on, but you mentioned the Beatles very early in the book. And I was like, yep, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to like this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love the Beatles. So, 
I was very happy that they made a made an appearance. Yeah, me too. The, um, <laughs> like I say, and, when, when you write, some of it's autobiographical. I, I think that's why some people, if they know me, they think it's a memoir. Like they're like, right. well, you like the Beatles and you like baseball and you run, so it must be about you. But it's really not about me. Right. If I'm anybody, right. uh, as I said, I'm I'm the father. I'm the guy who dies because I'm the guy who does, doesn't want to go away and always wants to go back everywhere. That's that's where the idea came from. Right. Right. Um, okay, but so, quick tangent, favorite Beatles song? Oh, my goodness, that is so hard. You know what, right I know. now, I would have to say, Got to Get You Into My Life. I, lo- it, I love that song. It's one of my favorites. If, if, you, if it's not that, uh, uh, Hey Jude, Let It Be, Love Them. Um, she Loves You, which is, like, so overplayed, and I, that's one of my favorites, and I want to hold your hand. Oh, my God, there's too many. When I'm 64 is a great one. Uh, yes. Fool on the Hill. I love the Fool on the Hill. Oh, there's so many. I, my oldest son, who's now a chiropractor uh, in, in Hershey, PA, and doing great, when he was going to chiropractic school down in Georgia and he'd be driving back home, he was starting to get into the Beatles. And I actually sent him every Beatle album on CD for his long ride home the one time. And, and we talked about which of the good songs on each album and which ones do we like the most. And that was hard for me because I kept saying, I like them all. Oh, and my life is another one. Penny Lane. I'm just trying to think of the, as our conversations, his favorite Beatles song was a no doubt, or, no doubt about about or a day in the life. He goes, that's my absolute favorite Beatles song. But if I had to pick one and only one, I would have to be uh, got to get you into my life. Those are all good. I, I appreciate that. My, my roommate <laughs> in college, and I, I'm sure we annoyed the snot out of all of our neighbors, but during finals week, it was 20, 23 hours of quiet, and then you got one hour to, like, blow off steam during finals. And the first thing we would do is um, start playing, oh, shoot, now I'm not going to be able to remember it. It's just Paul and, and John. Why did I bring this up since I can't remember the name of it? Um, oh, you know my name. Look up the number. Oh, my God, <laughs> the yes. weirdest little... <laughs> Hilarious. We would crank that ever. up and just laugh our butts off. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So what's your favorite Beatles song? In My Life. Oh, great. Yeah, good. All right, that was on my short list there, so good. It yeah. was, yeah. But, I mean, but then, you know, the, the, whatever whatever song I'm listening to, except probably Revolution Number 9, at the time, whatever <laughs> song I'm listening to is my favorite. Often. Yes, when I listen to the White Album, I just skip that. <laughs> yep, me too. <laughs> It's not really a song. <laughs> okay, not a Beatles podcast. Um, <laughs> out of your out of your experience with writing, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yes, uh, lot, lots and lots of advice. Number one, you have to just keep writing. If you want to be a writer, you're you're going to love to write, and so it's it's it's. Sometimes it's a task. Sometimes it's not fun. Editing and revising isn't always fun. Having people tell you you to uh, show, don't tell, and things like that, that's not always fun, trying to, trying to write and, 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 and get through all that. But the idea is when we practice a skill, we get better at it, and, and that's how we grow, and that's how we learn. And if you want to become a writer, you need to write. I think you also have to be humble and understand that People will find the flaws and the things that you aren't doing well, and you have to listen to that and learn and grow from that and, and not be like, well, that's the way I write, and that's my voice, and, and it's not wrong. I think you have to be willing to accept a lot of criticism and be willing to work through that. I think you have to – also, if you want to be published, you have to be humble again because you're going to get rejected 400 million times, if you're like me at least, and you have to just be resilient on that and say, okay. I can keep going forward, I can keep getting better, and, or I can keep trying again, and eventually you hope to find somebody who says, I believe in you, and I believe in your writing, and you get to put it out there, and, and, uh, and then other people hopefully read it and like it, but you also have to be used to, you know, used to people <laughs> reading your stuff, and even if it's published, they'll tell you, it's, yeah, I don't really like it, it's not that good. <laughs> right, yeah, you have to have thick skin. Yes. Absolutely. I'm sure they said the same thing to Steinbeck and Hemingway and uh, and all of them. So, Yes, I would imagine. Um, I don't want to give away the end of the book. Not that it's like a, a huge, you know, like 
a surprise or anything, but Thank you again to Paul for a really fun chat. I do always enjoy getting to know authors and learning a little bit more about them and about their stories, about the stories behind their stories. I am just a little bit nosy and I love learning about people and about their ideas and how they bring those ideas to life. So thank you again to Paul for joining me. If you are a fan of baseball, if you're a fan of road trips, if you're a fan of father-son stories, if you're a fan of stories that involve deceased relatives leaving complicated quests for their <laughs> their surviving heirs to follow and scatter their ashes, then you should definitely check out Scattering the Ashes. It is a, such a lovely and delightful book. It, it's really it's entertaining, it's got a lot of heart, it's got humor, and it's just a, a lovely tribute to a father and a son who are, and a son who's getting to know his father in an even deeper way. So definitely check out Scattering the Ashes by Paul Russell Semendinger. Thank you, as always, to you for joining me. I hope that you will join me again next time when I will be speaking to Dr. Sam Stia. Uh, it's fun that we're going from Dr. Paul Semendinger to Dr. Sam Stia. Uh, Dr. Stia is a physician, and we will be talking about his debut novel, The Edge of Elsewhere. And I am going to just give you a, for a fair warning that uh, there's going to be some fangirling because of the Beatles. I'm just going to leave it at that. But I'm very excited. So join me next time when I speak with Sam about his book, The Edge of Elsewhere. And you can tune in to find more about that novel and why I'm so excited about the Beatles and that novel. Thank you, as always, for joining me. If you are a fan of this podcast and you would like to help us out in any way, you can do so by following us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find us on all of those. And I love hearing from listeners, love hearing your thoughts. You can really help us out by giving us a review, whether that's five star or a written review. Either way, helps us to get the word out to other people who love books just like you and I. Well, like I said at the beginning of this episode, I hope you're having a great week. And as always, I hope that your day, your week, your month, your just your existence, I hope that your existence provides you with plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.